Welcome in, everybody. I have Dan Dick out today here for the podcast. Really excited. Dan, how are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. It's been a while since uh, since I've seen you, and uh, I know we text occasionally, but uh, I didn't realize you moved to Florida. What a move. Uh, hopefully, it's going well for you down there. Yeah, it's been, it's been a fun move for sure. Um, guys, I know Dan. I used to always go to his camps in high school and all that fun stuff, so a lot of memories going way back. Um, my first question for you today is, uh, let's just go back to high school. You grew up in the Vancouver area. Can you kind of describe what it was like playing high school basketball in Washington State? Yeah, I, I grew up in Vancouver, went to Prairie High School, graduated in, in 1997. Um, you know, Vancouver is basically a, a suburb of Portland. So um, I tend to say that I'm from the Portland area because anytime I've said Vancouver in the past, uh, people think it's either the Seattle area or I'm from Vancouver, BC and, and I'm Canadian. So uh, a lot of times I've said Portland, you know, growing up, um, would always in high school, go work out in Portland with, with different guys playing, playing open gyms with, with different guys from all over the Portland area, play the Pro, Portland pro-am leagues and, and different things. But, you know, when I was in high school, uh, the, the high school setting was much different than it is now in the state of Washington. Now you've got six classifications, um, back then, there were three classifications. So there was 1A, 2A, 3A. We were 3A uh, Prairie. Um, my high school team really was not very good until my senior year. Um, a lot of it was because we didn't have guys that, that bought in and loved the game. And then our the, my group um, and the younger guys underneath uh, my grade, you know, we all fell in love with just going to the gym and, and being there, you know, all, all day long, late at night, improving, getting better, competing. Um, and so we were able to, to improve. And then my senior year, we made the state tournament uh, and we played it at the kingdom. And there was we made it to the, the final four of the state tournament that year. And, uh, you know, we had close to 12000 people in, in the semifinals of the state tournament, the kingdom. And you look at the state tournaments now, uh, they're not getting very many people there. It's really disappointing to see for the current high school students uh, that are playing that they don't get that kind of uh, buy-in from, from uh, you know, communities to go follow the games. But overall, I had a great high school experience. A big part of it was because I had a great high school coach. Um, uh, after my freshman year, we got a new coach, and he was very connected in the AAU world. He was very uh, outgoing as far as finding opportunities for myself and my teammates to get better. So I look back on my high school experience as being a very positive one. For sure. Um, really quick, could you do you think you could give me like the best player you maybe played at against like in high school and then maybe like just in open gyms in high school you played against? So in in high school, uh, let's see. So in Vancouver, uh, in our league, we had a number of really good players. Um, Derek Neslin played at Portland State. He was one of their all-time leading scorers. Um, Richie Fromm, who you probably remember the name, played at Battleground High School, our, my rival high school, played in the NBA for about four years. Um, he was a year older. We were essentially workout partners um, and then high school rivals. Uh, so in, in the season, those were the best guys that played against. Um, in summer tournaments and summer games, I mean – you know, played Jamal Crawford in high school, summer league. We played uh, a name that a lot of people probably don't remember, Quincy Wilder. Maybe he was one of the best guards to ever come out of uh, the state of Washington. Um, you know, unfortunately, a couple things derailed him off the court. But he started at USC, went to Highline, played at, uh, was at Boise State for a short bit. Unbelievable player. Um, those are a couple guys. But I was lucky enough when I was in high school um, to be invited to, to, to work out at what was called the pro club in Redmond, Washington, kind of right down the street from Microsoft's head offices. So, um, as a high school kid, I would drive up there, spend my weekends in Seattle, staying at friend's house and work out as a high school kid with current college players and NBA players. So I was playing against Michael Dickerson, Eric Snow, who was with the Sonics at the time, uh, Detlef Schrempf, uh, Jason Terry, um, you know, there, there would be a run, there would be an hour, hour and 15 minute workout followed by an hour of pickup runs that were controlled. And there'd be one high school guy in the gym and that would be me. And then it would be the rest, like all American level college guys and pros. And you, you learn 
to figure it out awfully quickly because if you don't raise the level of your play, um, you're going to get left behind. You're not going to be, you know, part of the workouts anymore. So that was a big part of, uh, of my development as a player, but that was also a big, um, you know, eye opener because if I could compete against those guys, if I could learn in that setting, um, I, you know, I felt I had an opportunity to, to maybe, you know, have a decent career. For sure. Definitely some really big names there playing against in high school. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's go to, I, w- I want to ask you about after your freshman year in college, um, you decided to transfer to GU. Is there anything that you might want to share? Like what led you to come to GU? I mean, it wasn't that big of a school then. It kind of just got it started with yeah. their March Madness runs a little bit. Could you kind of explain like why you chose Gonzaga and to come play for Coach GU? Yeah, so it was actually after my sophomore year, um, but I'll kind of give you the overlay. So uh, in in AAU basketball, uh, before my junior year, um, the team I was on, Richie Fromm was on, um, and Gonzaga was recruiting him uh, pretty hard. Obviously, he ended up going to Gonzaga. So I got to know the Gonzaga coaching staff kind of uh, in that way. Uh, Dan Monson was the head coach. Coach Few and Billy Greer were assistants. And they were at all of our games watching Richie Fromm. They were, you know, recruiting other guys. Then the next year, um, I played on an AAU team. Casey Calvary, who was a Gonzaga player who's famous for the tip-in against Florida. Um, he was he was on uh, – we were on the same AAU team. And so they would continue to be at all our games because they were recruiting them really hard. They really didn't rec- – they did recruit me, but they didn't recruit me that hard because Gonzaga was not Gonzaga at that point. And – kind of the, the, the word around my recruitment was that I was going to go to a Pac-10 school at the time. And that was true. You know, at the time, you know, I had lofty goals and every good player, in particular, every good point guard on the West Coast, your goal is to go to the Pac-10 because you looked at the guards before me from the Pac-10. It was Terrell Brandon, Damon Stoudemire, Brevin Knight, um, you know, Jason Kidd. And I'm not putting my name uh, at, at the level of those guys necessarily, but – you know, I wanted to play against the best. I wanted to challenge myself against the best. And so that's where, you know, kind of that, hey, he's going to go to a Pac-10 school. Um, so oddly enough, uh, I, I did know the staff and I knew a lot of the guys that they were recruiting, but I I, I, I wasn't going to go there. And, and a lot of it was also because I didn't want to go to where it was cold <laughs> in the winter. Lo and behold, I go to Seattle where it rains every single day. Uh, and that's a whole <laughs> different thing. But so I was very aware of Gonzaga their coaching staff, their, their teammate, the team, uh, because a lot of those guys were really good friends. And then um, one of my high school teammates, Zach Gord, who was a year younger than me, was also being recruited by Gonzaga. So they would be at, at our high school practices, occasionally recruiting Zach. And I continue to, to talk to him a little bit, get to know him. Uh, fast forward, you know, my freshman year at UW went well. Uh, after my freshman year, I broke my foot in the summer rushed back from that injury to, to be a starter the first part of the year. Um, but something just didn't feel right as far as where I was in my career, my development, where I, what I wanted out of a team uh, to be a part of. Even though as a freshman UW, we went to the Sweet 16. Um, and, and I knew I, I wasn't happy and I wanted to transfer. And oddly enough, you know, because Richie Fromm and Zach Gordon, Casey Calvary were, were – high school and AAU teammates, I was keeping a close watch on what was going in Spokane. And I talked to them all the time. And when we, the Huskies played in Spokane at the arena against Gonzaga, they beat us. And UW, we were ranked like 17th at the time. And they beat us. And they beat us pretty, pretty easily. If I remember right, it was about 10, 12 point win. They beat us. And then I remember um, after the game, talking to Coach Few in the hallway, and I almost asked him at that time, how do I transfer? Because the night before that game, Richie Fromm and I went to the, the gym at, on Gonzaga's campus and we shot. And Richie tried to talk me into transferring at that time. <laughs> and so, you know, my mind had already wow. been kind of moving in the direction of transferring to Gonzaga. But, you know, at that point, it wasn't what college basketball is now with transfers like you, you get slided in one way, you leave. I mean, there's over 1,700 transfers this year. When I transferred, it was only a couple hundred a year, and there was a big black check mark that went on your resume as a player if you transferred. So, you know, kind of 
met, talked with Coach Few in the in the hallway after the game, and, and we I didn't get a chance to say, hey, I want to transfer because he was like, hey, you guys are going to be okay, you're fine. You got the big fellow in Todd McCulloch. You guys will get back. Lo and behold, we did make it back to the NCAA tournament. Um, but a couple weeks later, um, my season was over because I broke my foot again for a second time. So I had surgery. Um, season was over, and I just knew in my heart that it, UW wasn't for me anymore. Um, you know, I prayed about it, kind of thought about things, looked at what I wanted out of my career, and then oddly enough, Gonzaga has this amazing run to the late eight. A cup that during that time frame, uh, right when I'm thinking about transferring, and those are my friends, Richie and Casey and, and Zach Gore, who's redshirting, and and I know Matt Santangelo a little bit, and, and some of those guys, and I'm just th- sitting there watching. I'm like, that's what I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of guys that are maximizing their individual potential, while at the same time winning and having fun. And so, you know, a couple weeks after the the, the season was over. Um, I decided to transfer, uh, oddly enough, only one of the coaches at university of Washington tried to talk me into staying. Um, there was only two schools that I reached out to Gonzaga and St. Louis. Um, oddly enough, the head coach there was Lorenzo Romar, who was, who then went to UW now is at Pepperdine right. or yeah, he's at Pepperdine now. Um, so I, I ended up taking one trip, one visit on for recruiting, uh, during that time going to Gonzaga and I transferred or I committed on the visit. So, uh, worked out pretty well for me, but it was an odd kind of a zigzagging way to get to, to Gonzaga for me. Right. For sure. Those are some really, really cool stories for sure. It's definitely different how the transfer portal works nowadays. Yeah. And the other thing is, is I had to sit out for a whole year as a red shirt. Now guys don't have to do that. And that was the best thing for me because I had to, to get my foot fully healthy after my knee surgery. I had to get in the weight room and get stronger. And then I got to compete against Matt Santangelo, Richie Fromm, Mike Nelson every single day in practice. I mean, by the time I was ready to play in games the following year, I'm pretty sure Coach Few had a a solid idea of what to expect from me. Uh, And I knew what to expect of of what was needed of me. So um, I think it really helped me, and, and I would think it helped the program too. Right. I want to ask you, um, like you said, I know you played against some really good players in open gym in high school. So I, I know you saw the NBA talent and all that stuff. But was there ever like, even if it's in college or high school, was there ever a moment when you're like, OK, like I could really be an NBA player one day? Was Do you remember that moment where you thought to yourself, yeah, maybe after in practice or an open gym, you're like, wow, I can really compete with anyone um i mean there's a couple different times well going into my junior year in high school and the aau scene is so different now um uh richie Fromm and i went to a camp uh it was it was the pump best of the west camp at cal state dominguez and you know you got some of the best players in uh, high school players in kind of from texas west that would go to this camp and okay. and i was Going into my junior year, and I was able to make one of the all-star games. Um, I think there was three all-star games. I can't remember which one I made. I didn't make the top all-star game um, because guys that were in the top all-star game were McDonald's All-Americans for the most part. But I made one of the all-star games, missed my first shot, and then I hit 11 shots in a row uh, the the rest of the the all-star game. Um, And so I think that was one where, like, hey, I'm playing against some of the better players high school in the country. I'm playing well. Um, gave me a huge boost of confidence. And then going into my senior year, I went to the Nike All-American camp, uh, where at the time, uh, Nike had the most exclusive camp. Uh, there was like 112 players um, that went. I was the only guy from the state of Washington that went. For example, you know, on my team that week, uh, Chris Burgess, who played at Duke in Utah, is now an assistant coach at Utah. He was the number one ranked high school player in the country going into the camp. Um, he was a teammate that week, Corey McGetty, who, uh, played at Duke. And then in the NBA, we were actually teammates with the Clippers. We were teammates that week. I remember playing that week against Baron Davis, uh, Ron Artest, Elton Brand. Um, you know, there was everywhere you look, there were pros and I was able to make one of the all-star games, uh, that week as well. And so I think at that point I started seeing like, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm stacking up really well against a lot of these players that, 
you know, at the time are ranked really high. Everyone talks about rankings. They're important to a certain amount. They're overvalued by too many people. But what it did for me was it, it let me know that, hey, I'm playing against this kid from Dallas. I'm playing against this kid from Chicago, New York, Miami, wherever it might be. And I'm just as good, if not better, uh, than those guys. Yeah, there was a couple guys that gave me problems, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, I never backed down and I figured out, you know, how I could create advantages and, and how I needed to, uh, you know, limit some of my weaknesses in, the, in those settings. So, um, you know, I think those two would have been big, big opportunities for me to think, hey, maybe I can do this. Okay, very, very cool. Um, so you get drafted. Um, walk me through, like, is there any crazy story you had when you first got drafted? Like, any crazy practice story when you were like, wow, I'm really, like, in the NBA now? Or, like, kind of like a crazy, like, interaction when you first got uh, to Atlanta? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, you know, I mean, the, the, the draft process is really crazy and unique. And it's changed over the years. Um you know, when I was done uh, at GU, I actually moved to Chicago for about two months um, to work with guys that, that my agent hired, um, both strength coaches and trainers, uh, to get ready for the pre-draft workouts. And I think I went to 17 different uh, pre-draft workouts with teams. I mean, I was all over the board from, you know, possibly as high as, I think 14 was the highest that, 17 was the highest that probably legitimately would have gone. Uh, and then I was all the way to the end of the first round and, and ended up sliding to be the last pick in the first round. But, you know, you go through that process, you learn a lot about yourself, you learn a lot about the NBA and, and the fact that it's a it's a business. Everyone's out for their own. Uh, the teams that and organizations that stand out understand that, but then they get guys to buy into a, a let's do this all together type of mentality and culture. But I think, you know, maybe a welcome to the NBA moment for me would have been in summer league uh, right after getting drafted. Um, this was before Vegas had a summer league, uh, the Hawks. We went to – we had about five, six days of practice in Atlanta before we went to Boston for a week of games. And uh, we had a really veteran summer league team. Eric Musselman was the head coach of that team. He was now in Arkansas. But uh, we had guys that were, you know – a couple year veterans, but they needed the experience of playing, you know, still a summer league. So we had a, we had a lot of really good games that year, but I remember, uh, set a back pick on Richard Jefferson. And I, I was always the little guy who would go screen people. I wasn't worried about, you know, back picking and ticking off a big guy or, or kind of throwing an extra little shoulder in there. And, and I just remember setting a back pick and Richard Jefferson tackling me. And all of a sudden we're on the ground and, you know, we kind of throw a couple kidney punches at each other and we both got ejected. That was like my third or fourth game in summer league because he, he didn't like the back screens that I was setting. Uh, he thought I was too physical, but uh, you know, that would have been kind of maybe a welcome to the NBA type moment. Cause right after that, I'm sitting in the locker room cause we both get ejected. I go to my, my locker, the locker room and I'm the only one sitting in the locker room and I'm hearing a banging on the door. I'm like, Oh, he trying to, or is he trying to keep this thing going? It was actually uh, one of the other agents from from my agent's office just to kind of cool me down. But uh, yeah, that was an interesting moment for sure. Wow, that that's insane. <laughs> but I want to. You played for a lot of a uh, lot of different teams in the NBA. Um, I'm sure there were cities or places that you like to live more than others. Where was your favorite city? Do you think you liked to play in uh, and why? You know, each each team and city had its own uniqueness about it that looking back, I enjoyed. Um, you know, Atlanta was I, – I, I looking back, it's a better city than I gave it credit for when I lived there. And I think a lot of it is because it was my first time living outside of the Northwest. Um, so, you know, that's a great city. Uh, I played for the Blazers twice, which is – that's home. You know, so, uh, you know, I – I'm one of the very few people that can say they got fired from their, their dream job three times. I got traded as a player from the Blazers twice. I worked as a player development coach for a year. And when they blew up the front office and the coaching staff, I wasn't retained. Um, so I got fired from the Blazers three times. Uh, I never thought I'd like living in L.A., but when I played for the Clippers, we absolutely loved it. Um, you know, Boston is, is unbelievable because 
you walk into the practice facility and you look up and there's at the time there's 16 championship banners like what what type of standard is set there i mean it's unbelievably high you know and then new orleans <coughs> excuse me new orleans was so good to me it was a time of my career after being in in dallas where you know i was kind of the odd man out rotationally because of how good the team was loved living in dallas but i wasn't really going to get an opportunity there i got traded in new orleans and my opportunity came and so i, I love new orleans because of that um, and there's a lot of uniqueness. That was pre-Katrina. Um, I've had the chance to go back a number of different times since. Uh, and, and they're still rebuilding parts of that city. It's crazy to think. All right. Um, I want to – you you've gotten to play against two of – maybe the two best players of all time, uh, Michael Jordan and LeBron. Do you have any, like, crazy stories, like maybe guarding them or, like, going against them one night that you could maybe tell the yeah. podcast about? Well, i throw Kobe into that mix too. Um, you know, Kobe, I was with the Blazers and I think Kobe had 65 against us. Um, and it was like, it was unreal. Everything he shot went in. I've gone back and I've, I've watched some of the highlights and there was a play defensively um, that I stepped in front and took the charge. Obviously, I'm like a, a journeyman player. I'm not going to get the call. Kobe runs right over me. <laughs> <laughs> they call it a, a block on me and it's a clear charge, but you know, that's, that's one thing. Kobe is unreal. Uh, you know, as far as LeBron, um, you know, I mentioned the, the summer league in, in Boston. Well, the following year after my rookie year, so going into my second year, this was when LeBron gets drafted. Um, we played against LeBron, uh, in his first summer league and you could tell like right off the bat, like there's something different about this guy. He's like 18 and a half years old at the time. Obviously, he's physically one of the biggest and strongest players already at that time. Um, you could just tell he was on another level at, at that early stage. <clears throat> Fast forward another year or two later, Garden LeBron in uh, in Cleveland. I'm with Portland at the time. Gets switched out. Um, I'm guarding him on on the wing, the right wing, and uh, he's backing me down. And uh, for uh, arm bar here, hand here, back me down, back me down. And I, as a little guy like myself, you, you take the hit, you take the hit. At some point, you got to, you, you make a stand. You either really chuck them or you try to pull the chair and take, take a charge, get a charge called. Well, <clears throat> I pulled the chair and also got my legs wrapped up in, in his legs and he fell backwards. They called a charge on me, but he sprained his ankle. It wasn't anything crazy bad, but he's kind of on the floor and, you know, I'm, we're both on the ground there and, and on the baseline, all the fans in the front row are like yelling at me. And it's like, <laughs> I, I remember that one because that, that's pretty funny. But uh, then playing against Jordan, I mean, you know, kind of like your age, you grow up, you watch Kobe, you watch LeBron. Those are your guys, right? For me, it was Jordan, right? And so um, my rookie year was Jordan's last year. There was three guys or three games that we played against the Wizards. First game I was hurt. So I didn't get to play against him. But I remember walking out of, of the locker room to go sit on the bench and go out through the tunnel. And Jordan walks by. <laughs> it was like there's this aura about Michael Jordan walking by. Like there's security. There's everybody wanting pictures, photographers. I was like, whoa, that's Michael Jordan. Um, but I did get a chance to guard him on a couple plays later on uh, when I did in, the, in two of the games uh, later on in the season. And that's something that, um, you know, was pretty cool. It's the only time I've ever honestly been on a court and had to do like a double take. Like, is that really who I think it is? <laughs> yeah, that's insane for sure. Um, playing against your idol for yeah. sure. Um, growing up. Um, once again, guys, Dan Dickow joining me today. Um, I got one more question for you, Dan, but this is actually kind of. Not really, it's more of like a business question. Um, you've sticked around in Spokane, you've started um, the barber shops around town, and then you just opened Shoot360 um, here in town. What kind of drew you to Spokane to kind of open businesses um, here in Spokane? Yeah, good question. You know, Spokane was so good to me when I was in college. Uh, it had a special place in my heart. And I, when I mentioned I wasn't retained with the Portland Trailblazers coaching staff, you know, I had some just, <coughs> excuse me, decisions to make. And my family and my wife and I, we'd always said, you know, 
if we ever move somewhere that's not based on having to go somewhere for you know a playing job or a coaching job, Spokane would be the place to go to. And so at that point, that's when we moved to Spokane, uh, decided to open up the Barbers, you know, and and then just recently, about six seven months ago, yeah, I opened up Shoot Three Sixty. It's uh, it's a pretty <coughs> amazing basketball training facility. Uh, there's technology that um, gives you instant feedback on every shot that you take. Uh, it's it's a chance where I know if I was a kid growing up, I would have been here hours on end every single day, um, getting better and and working on my jump shot. So it's cool to kind of give back to to Spokane in that way, but also in 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 form of business too. Right, for sure. Um, Dan, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on today, my podcast today. I really appreciate you uh, coming on. Absolutely. Today. Enjoy that uh, humidity down in Florida. And when you get back to Spokane, come check out Shoot360. <laughs> yes, for sure. All right, guys. Uh, next Friday, I'll be uploading again. Dan, Absolutely. Have a good one.